I've been doing a series on my book, The Secret of the Anointing, Accessing the Power of God to Walk in Miracles. What I started to teach was how to cast out demons and heal the sick. Once you have received the anointing from God, which is the most important part of being able to cast out demons and healing the sick, because it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Once you have received the anointing, what do you do with it? Because you can have the anointing and you could, you could not use it the right way, how God wants. You could, be, you could be casting out demons in the old wineskin way. You could be doing it in a way that's not effective, in a way that is outside of God's order and his principles. So it's so important that you, you're not just looking for, for God to fill you with anointing, but that you are making sure you're using the anointing effectively, how God wants, amen? I began teaching, okay, now, once you have the anointing, how to cast out demons and heal the sick. Today we're going to, it's part two, we're going to continue learning, being equipped, how to cast out demons and heal the sick. Amen. So a little recap from last week. The first step is to follow the Holy Spirit, to not just be so zealous and focused like, I want to cast out demons, (laughs) or to see someone and be like, I must cast a demon out of you, but we have to follow the Holy Spirit. Um, We can't be mechanical like a robot. We have to be listening to the Holy Spirit's voice of if it's time to cast out the demon, is it? our place to cast out the demon right now. Um, And then also, we have to make sure we're not using our gifts wrongly. Like when the Holy Spirit wants you to, to use one of his gifts, but you are more excited about another gift of the Holy Spirit but God doesn't want you to use that right now. He wants, to, he wants you to focus on deliverance, for example, um, instead of maybe prophesying someone's future. You know, you have to be uh, obedient to the Holy Spirit and really, really having the fear of God. Like, this is, a, this, is, this is the work of God that I'm doing, not me casting out a demon, but I'm being a vessel of the Holy Spirit. So this is God's job. This is God's work. I better make sure that he's able to do all he wants through me. I don't get in the way. Amen? And then I also taught that number two, the the second step is that you must operate in the principles and laws of the spiritual realm because God is a God of order and he has certain principles. We can't just be chaotic and do whatever or, or go by our feelings and however we think, but we must go by his word, his principles, his spiritual laws are in his word. When we have the Holy Spirit to give us real revelation from the word, and we have anointed teaching to open our eyes, to help us bring understanding of what the word of God is saying, bring more. Many times the word of God says this, it's like one sentence, right? But There's so much more than that one sentence that the Holy Spirit will speak, bringing understanding and more meaning. Amen? And so these these principles that we must operate in are the principle, is the principle of authority, that we are casting out demons by walking in our authority. That's what makes demons go. So we better not be doing things that have nothing to do with walking in authority, like raising our voice, thinking that the level of the voice is what's going to make the demon go. No, it's authority. The president of the United States can whisper something or yell it. It'll happen regardless. The law or what the whatever, you know? Um, and uh, we, we, you can get distracted sometimes when you're not operating in the principle of authority. You can get distracted with other methods trying other things to try to get the demon to go, putting objects on people and putting your hands and physical effort into it, pushing them down or something, trying to beat the demon out of somebody or something. (laughs) 
There's all sorts of crazy things that people might do <laughs> when they are not walking in this revelation of the principle of authority. Amen. We also have to walk in the principle of territory, meaning it's your territory isn't the whole world, but your territory where you have domain to walk in the authority over other people's life, like casting demons out of other people, is a specific place, specific places. For example, I can't just decide after church today, you know what, I know that there's so many demon-oppressed people in a lukewarm church over there. Um, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to disturb the service and say, excuse me, the Lord told me I need to come and take over the service and set free these people in here. That'd be awesome, but is that in the principle of territory? That's not my territory. Amen. So we have to make sure we're operating in our, the principle of territory and also the principle of free will. Meaning you can see someone that you know needs deliverance, but they still have free will. So you can't force deliverance upon them. Amen? So that's a recap. So those were the two big uh, steps, the two first steps that I taught. Um, and then this, the, the last major step, third step of casting out demons is using the, using the spiritual keys that God has given us that unlocks deliverance, that unlocks people to receive deliverance, unlocks people out of the chains of bondage. So to use these keys that God has given us, like the keys of the kingdom given to Peter, the keys are, the meaning of that is revelation, revelation of how demons will be released from a person. What's making them to stay and how do we get them to, to be unraveled and the chains be broken? Amen? So, the first key I'm going to share right now, there are, first of all, there are many different keys that unlock complete deliverance. And for some cases, the person may only need one key. Others may need two. Others may need three. It depends just on the case. That's why we have to be following the Holy Spirit. And so as I'm teaching you now how to cast out demons, it's so important that you're always remembering we must follow the Holy Spirit. This shouldn't be like step one, step two, step three, and it's just something, a repetitive thing, religious thing that you just do every time. There's not a, a, a certain way it's going to be every time. It will be different because... In the spiritual realm, these different demonic oppressions, they're different. Some, per, some people have one chain. Others have two chains. Others have three chains. Some have three chains, but they're all tangled. Some have three chains that, that are really heavy. You know, someone can have a principality and then a low-level demon. Someone can have a, a, a deep covenant that was made over their life, which makes the, de the, the demonic oppression stronger. It's all different according to each person. So that's why we have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. So the first key is the first key that, that unlocks deliverance, which is the key that most people need to have, is faith. Faith that Jesus can deliver or heal you. A person must have faith. A person must come to Jesus in faith. I believe Jesus wants to and can deliver and heal me. It says in, in Mark 5, 25, a woman in the crowd has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. 
Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. (laughs) Hallelujah. So this woman had faith that Jesus wanted to heal her and that he would heal her. And not just that, but she positioned herself to receive. She, she positioned herself where the anointing was flowing. In today's time, that action of grabbing the hem of Jesus' garment today The action of that is positioning yourself where the anointing of Jesus is flowing, where it is being released. Today, Jesus moves through vessels. He said to his disciples and to us today, I give you all authority. You will do the works that I did and greater. You heal the sick, cast out demons. That's what he said to his disciples, which is what he says to us now. So now Jesus, in power, his anointing, moves through vessels. Not everyone, he wants to move through every believer, but as I've been teaching, the the majority of this series has been teaching how to receive the anointing. You must have a heart that God can trust. You must be humble, pure, childlike, and surrendered. And then God will pour out the anointing in your life. And so today, to to grab the hem of Jesus' robe, that's like coming to church where God's power is. That's what you are doing today. But you have to to reach out. You can't. She could have just stood there and watched him go by. But she reached out in faith. So position yourself where the anointing is, but don't just position yourself. Reach out in faith. Believe, I'm going to receive deliverance today. I'm going to receive healing today. And that's the action of touching his, reaching out and touching the hem of his robe, pulling on the anointing. So you coming to church today, that's you touching, reaching out and touching the hem of Jesus' robe. It's also you watching online. You're positioning yourself where the anointing is flowing. And um, now when we're talking about for you, when it's time for you to cast out demons, this is the, the, one, the big key that is needed. Sometimes it's the only key that is needed that unlocks the deliverance from the person is faith that Jesus can and wants to deliver and heal them, number one. And also the part two of this first key is positioning themselves where the anointing is. In that case would be you, your prayer, you executing your authority over that demon in their life. So when a person opens up to you with free will, they're in your territory, it's time God is leading you to cast a demon out of this person. And, and they are now believing, they're speaking maybe, yes, I want Jesus to deliver me like what you've testified about. I want Jesus to do that for me. And I, I believe it. Or they don't even have to say I believe it. But Holy Spirit will show you their faith is there. And now it is time to walk in your authority and cast the demon out. And so for some people, that's the only key that is needed Faith, not faith that God exists, but specifically faith that by his stripes we are healed, that this healing and deliverance 
is my inheritance as a child of God. It's already mine, but now I need to receive it. So you're having faith that it's time to receive now. You're having faith that it's already yours and it's time to receive and God's going to do it. The power of God's going to move and it's, time, it's receiving time. That kind of faith, that the right kind of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. So I know we're going to go on to other keys now, but it's not, it shouldn't be like a, a religious ritual. What do you want to renounce? Sometimes that, that key isn't needed. Sometimes it's, only, that's why sometimes you'll see when I pray for people, sometimes there isn't any renouncing, but they're set free. It's because that key wasn't needed. It will do no harm to renounce. Renouncing is great always. But we just have to make sure we're not getting into a religious ritual of things. However, I will say something, something else that's important for you to know. Um, well, first of all, I do want to mention the second, the, the second key is renouncing. The second key is renouncing areas of bondage and open doors and covenants. And I'm going to teach more about that in just a second. But I first want to say that um, renouncing is so powerful. Renouncing is using your authority in Christ, the power of life that's in your tongue. And you are saying, I don't want this bondage anymore. When you say, when a person or you says, I renounce anxiety, I renounce depression, I renounce witchcraft, I renounce insomnia, I renounce this sickness, whatever it is. You are saying, I don't accept this bondage in my life anymore. The truth of the matter is, is that when you say, I have anxiety, I have anxiety, I have this sickness, and that's all you're doing is you're saying you have it. You are accepting it. You are accepting the devil's portion in your life. This is the spiritual reality. What we should be doing is rejecting diagnoses. You know, you don't have to feel paranoid like you can't repeat what the doctor said. You can say, the doctor says I have this, but I am healed by Jesus' stripes. I don't receive that diagnosis. I reject, I reject that. I, uh, any kind of sickness that's in my body must get out. It cannot stay because I am healed. This is my inheritance from Jesus. And so if someone asks you, oh, what did the doctor say? You can say the truth. You can say what the doctor said. But ju just don't stop there. You know, don't, don't, don't take the action of accepting it in your heart and, and doing nothing about it. This, this is wartime now. When you receive diagnoses or when something is going on in your body or your mind, something's happening. Anxiety, depression, um, insomnia, sickness, whatever this attack is, do not be like the world and just say, oh, great, this is my portion. I have this now. I got to find the worldly uh, fix for this. No, it's wartime. Be spiritual. Yes, go in the spirit. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. So submit to God by going in the spirit. It's wartime. Like, Submit to God's word. God says that we are in a spiritual war. We have to be aware of the devil who's roaring around like a lion seeking whom we can devour. It's that the Bible says that we need to put on the full armor of God. The, the Bible says that we need to take our authority over the devil. So the Bible says all of these action words about us being a warrior in Christ and being active. And walking in authority. That's the word of God. It's all over the word of God, how it's instructing us to take action in the spirit. To not just sit there. So this is a big meaning of submit to God. The word is, the, the word is God. Submit to the word. The word saying to resist the devil. I'm going to resist the lies of the devil. The word says by his stripes I am healed. The word says that I should be taking, walking in my authority over the devil. So submit to God, follow his instructions. Action time, resist the devil. Resist these attacks, these lies, these ways the devil's trying to say, you have this. No, you don't have it until you accept it. 
Reject it. You'll be amazed. It'll go away. You'll see. You'll see. Try it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Put God to the test in you. As you walk in your authority and you see the power of God move through you as you walk in authority and the devil defeated every time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a lot of people have been accepting the devil's portion and that's what's brought the bondage. Is that, That's been the open door. I mean, that can be the open door. Sometimes simply accepting a diagnosis and not, do, not going in the spirit and rejecting it and, and, and saying, by his stripes I'm healed. I believe this, that God will heal me. So sometimes not doing that and just being idle and accepting what was said, that what the devil wants you to have, the portion, that's the open door. So, so when you started having those symptoms, you didn't, you didn't have the sickness yet. You didn't have the demon yet. But once you accepted them and didn't reject them, it now, the door was open and now the demon has come in or the infirmity has come in. And so now you do have that. Now you, you didn't need deliverance before. You just needed to walk in your authority and reject the devil and he would flee. No weapon formed against you will prosper. If you resist the devil, then he will flee. But now the weapon has prospered because you allowed it. So now you need deliverance. You need healing. You need the anointing to destroy the yoke and you will be free. But so, so many times if someone has accepted the devil's portion in their life, which is most people that have bondage, especially because they have not gotten this kind of equipping. This kind of equipping is rare in the body of Christ, which this stuff is like milk that I'm teaching you, spiritual milk. This is the basics. Kindergartners, four-year-olds, three-year-olds should even be doing this. Yeah, this is basics of being a child of God and walking in authority. Children can be victorious over the devil. Absolutely. Hallelujah. So, Many people haven't had this equipping, so they really have accepted that bondage. And so when, you have, when you've never rejected the devil, renouncing is so important. You need to say, I didn't reject this before, but I'm rejecting it now. I renounce this anxiety. This is not my portion. I renounce this sickness. This is not my portion. By his stripes, I am healed. I am free. God has given me a perfect peace, a sound mind, not fear or anxiety. So I renounce this anxiety. So that's, it's powerful when one renounces. That's what's happening in the spiritual realm is you're rejecting the devil. And it's very important, especially when you haven't really rejected the devil before. Amen. So um, what I wanted to say was when, when, whenever someone renounces, it is making the grip of the devil, demons, loosen. So what happens many times is a, a person will renounce, they will renounce, and all of a sudden you'll start seeing um, demons leave them. Because they were where the anointing is, and that was all that was needed. They renounced, that was the key, they were where the anointing is, they had faith, boom. Boom. There didn't even need to be a declaration yet because the authority was already being executed by the vessel of God just ministering and walking in their authority. Hallelujah. Praise God. Back to the first key about faith. I just wanted to rewind a little bit because I know I started getting to renouncing. But with faith, it really just depends. Like sometimes the faith has to really be ripe. Sometimes you need to desire and want your freedom. Sometimes you need to really be surrendered to Jesus and really desiring his inheritance of freedom. And that's the faith that's required. Sometimes that's the key. Like it must be that ripe faith. One can have other doors open up and they're not really serious about their freedom. But they have faith that God can deliver them. But you, you need to have this ripe faith. But, but then there can be different cases. You, 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 can't, you can't take everything though like, it must be this way. If you don't have faith, you're not going to get delivered. Because there's exceptions sometimes. 
Holy Spirit moves in all sorts of ways. Generally, the faith is very important. The ripe faith is important. But I remember one time when we had church in the park, there was this mother who brought her teenage son. He didn't want to come to the church. He wanted to stay. He was depressed and just stay in his room. But she made him come. And he started manifesting when he got there. And that faith sparked up in his heart once he got there because God's presence was there. And he ended up being set free. He ended up being healed. He took his glasses off and he could see after his deliverance. And he had this encounter with Jesus where he spoke to Jesus and saw Jesus. And he shared in a testimony, like scripture he was speaking, like he wasn't in the word before. You could tell like he really had this encounter with Jesus. But, you know, he came to the church seemingly not really having faith. You know, so God can do a lot in a short amount of time. And God can also do a lot with a mustard seed. Amen? So sometimes the faith needs to be ripe. And, and it doesn't mean you need to wait for your feelings to catch up. I do not mean that. Faith is not in the feelings. But faith is about action and choice. So what looks like faith is surrender to God, is believing his word, not feeling his word is true, but choosing to believe his word and what he says. And so the devil can be speaking all sorts of lies to you, you know, like, oh, this won't happen. You won't be delivered. But you reject them and you speak the truth and you speak, I believe I will be healed, even if you don't feel like it. But you speak it. That's what God counts as faith. So you can all have faith right now. You don't need to wait for your faith to be ripe. It's up to you. Hallelujah. So now back on to renouncing. So renouncing is a big key um, to be free. It says in, uh, it says in Acts 19.18, that many of those who had become believers were coming, confessing, and disclosing their former sinful practices. So this was in the Acts church. So it says many people coming to the church who, uh, who had become believers, they were believers, they were confessing and disclosing their former sinful practices. So this wasn't just like, oh, I want to get this off my chest. This wasn't just doing it in a religious way, like the word says we should confess our sins to one another, so I'm doing this, they were renouncing. They were getting free as this was happening. So renouncing is in the word of God. It's confessing the formal sinful practices publicly. And the very next scripture, it says, Many of those who had practiced magical arts collected their books and throwing book after book on the pile began burning them in front of everyone. So the very next sentence is, is also a form of um, a, another key to be free for some people is getting rid of objects that have witchcraft attached to them where demons can literally be attached to some, uh, uh, some um, objects. And so... This really shows us that, that what was happening in this scripture here was freedom, was deliverance. It wasn't just like, oh, yes, I'm just getting rid of these things. I'm confessing my sins. And I'm getting rid of these things because I'm a believer now. No, they were renouncing. They were getting free. They were thro detaching themselves from these demonic objects, and they were getting free. Hallelujah. Um, and it says in Ephesians 4.27, do not give the devil a foothold. So the meaning of this is, this is speaking to believers. Don't give the devil a foothold. Because when you give him a foothold, you are opening up a door where a demon can come in and have legal access and bring oppression. People think Christians can't have demons well, why is this saying to believers, do not give the devil a foothold? If you do give the devil a foothold, that means you're opening up the door. That means he can come in, right? 
<laughs> so this is instruction. Keep doors shut to the devil. If you don't, there will be consequences. You can be a believer and have demons then. Is what the scripture is saying. Amen? So demonic oppression in general, it only comes when there is a foothold. When a door has been opened. So, to make the demon go, sometimes when the anointing is is powerful, all that's needed is that person had to have faith and the authority executed. They're free. But other times, the, the oppression is more complex. And how it isn't complex is that demons have gotten legal access to be there and stay there. And so what we need to do is is figure out by the, by the wisdom, the leading of the Holy Spirit, what keys unlock this legal access, to, like them to be free, them to not have, demons to not have this legal access anymore, them to not allow to legally stay there anymore. Now, obviously, demons do have legal access among many Christians because so many Christians have addiction, depression, anxiety. If we took a poll of all the Christians in the world, you know, who, who has either depression, anxiety, um, infirmity, generational problems that keep recurring, um, panic attacks, insomnia, demonic dreams recurring, um, uh, rage, addiction, etc. <laughs> it's probably most would have at least one of them. Many of them have several of them. So obviously, demons do have legal access in people, even when believers, even when they say, I'm G- I-, I believe in Jesus. Otherwise, every single believer in this whole world would not have addiction or depression or anxiety or all these things are demons, right? So yes, they have legal access. That's why they're still able to stay there even though you're a believer. So we need to find out what this legal access is that they have and find this key that makes the legal access be gone from them, and they have to go. They're forced to go by the rules of the kingdom of God. So um, renouncing many times releases that legal access. Because you have really accepted this demonic oppression, the legal access is that it's like the devil's like, well, you want me here. You invited me in, and you keep telling me to be here. By continuing to confess the oppression over and over again. And by not walking in your authority and rejecting the devil. The devil's like, I have legal access. You invited me here. Just like Eve and Adam and Eve gave the keys to the devil. It was their choice, right? So renouncing when, when you're saying, nope, I don't want you here. I know I invited you in before. I allowed you in before, but... I don't want you here anymore. I'm using my authority in Christ. Get out. I reject you. I reject this. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And many times, that's, the, that's when the demons lose their legal access. Oh, they use the power of life and walked in their authority, and now I have to go. Is what the demons, what it's like for the demons, right? So, um... I want to go over uh, the different kinds of uh, doors that can be, the different, the different kinds of, of doors that are opened when demons have come and have legal rights. So the first one is when, when the person themselves opens up the door themselves, which is what I've been talking about. This happens by them agreeing with diagnosis, diagnoses, or, and not rejecting it, or agreeing with uh, the, the lies of the devil coming at them and not rejecting. This also can come by, through sin. When a person sins, uh, does drugs, gets drunk, sleeps around, uh, sp- speaking words of death, sinning in all various ways, that opens up a door. By disobeying God's commands, that's opening up a door. That's saying, it's like, it's like saying you're not really a true believer. It's like saying, I'm not 
valuing God's word, I'm going, I'm doing what the devil wants me to do. Devil wants you to get drunk. Devil wants you to do drugs. Devil wants you to sleep around. De- devil wants you to curse people. Devil wants you to, to lie, to cheat, to steal, to kill, to hurt people. Devil wants you to do these things. So when you're doing these things, you're saying, okay, devil, I'll do these things. So in the spiritual realm, it's like you're making him your master. Even if you're going to church and you say Jesus is Lord, but your actions are showing that he is your master at, in, less, in at least part of your life. So over here, even though it's just part of your life, devil is your master. So devil for sure can come in and bring oppression. Another way that one can open up a door is by doing witchcraft, by going to a psychic. That's, that's inviting demonic powers in your life. By going to a psychic, you're saying, I open myself up. I give a foothold for the devil to come and give a demonic insight to me. A demonic prophetic, a false prophetic, but demonic insight to, to give it to me. And when you do that, the doors open for the devil to come more, demons to come more. Same with doing anything with witchcraft, playing with Ouija boards, playing with tarot cards. You are opening yourself up to demonic powers, giving the foothold to the devil to come in that way. Also, believing that crystals will heal you, not Jesus will heal you, but crystals, that they have the supernatural power to heal you. That is also accessing witchcraft, opening up the door for, to witchcraft powers to come in your life and make demons to come. Um, also, I, I, I mentioned um, also speaking death. I just want to mention this as its own thing, as its own way to open up a door, speaking words of death over yourself, speaking death over other people, which simply means speaking against the word of God. That opens up a door too. You are agreeing with the devil's will and portion for your life when you do that. So that opens up a door. Um, Also, making demonic covenants opens up a door. So making a demonic covenant can be certain things like this, saying, I want to die. When you just say those words out loud, I want to die, I want to kill myself, In the spiritual realm, you are making a demonic covenant with the devil when you confess those words. Also, people sometimes make deals with the devil. People hear, I remember one time, a gentleman got delivered at Fivefold Church so powerfully, he got delivered from a demonic covenant, from a deal with the devil he made. His uncle got in an accident. He was like, it felt, seemed like he might be on his deathbed. So he was panicking. And he didn't know about the power of Jesus. He was a Christian, but didn't know about the power of Jesus. But yet he heard in rap songs about making deals with the devil. And not only did he not know about the power of Jesus, he didn't know the danger of making deals with the devil. He didn't know that. He just knew, oh, you can make deals with the devil. Maybe he will have power to help my uncle. So he went seeking out um, how to make a deal with the devil. He was desperate. He just went on Hollywood Boulevard. And he, he started talking to someone. He started talking about what he was looking for. And that person worked at the, the Scientology, the Church of Scientology, and says, I can help you with that. Well, he ended up saying, you need to give up something. And I can give you this. What do you want to give up? And he says, my happiness. Are you sure? Yes. And then he says, I need you to sign with blood now. And so he did. And so he did. And, and then his uncle survived, but lived a horrible life after that. No peace in such sickness. And his happiness left completely. So he came to the church. He actually um, had a dream and heard a woman voice speaking, I think, something like, get out of him in the order you entered or something like that. And he knew it was from God, so he just was obsessed all of a sudden with trying to find that voice. He was looking for Joyce Meyer. It wasn't Joyce Meyer. <laughs> and then one time he, he stumbled upon a video of Fivefold Church or me ministering, 
And I was like, that's her. <laughs> and so he came to the church. We were in the park at the time. And he starts manifesting. I call him forward, and I start commanding the demon to go. And um, all of a sudden, as I'm commanding the demon to go, all of a sudden, the demon speaks out of him. He made a deal. And so when the demon spoke that, the, we don't need to l- listen to demons to give us information, by the way. But sometimes it is a way Holy Spirit reveals by those demons manifesting and they speak something. So in that moment, I, I knew there was a deal he made with the devil. So I said, demon, allow him to speak now. Because I knew that I couldn't just say, go, 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 go. There was a key that was needed to unlock this deliverance, which was him to renounce the covenant. So I said to him, did you ever make a deal with the devil? He says, yes. And then he explained it, what I just shared with you. And he says, I renounced that, and I prayed for, I commanded the demon to go, and the demon left him. And (laughs) hallelujah. I'm going to have to share this video and testimony after this. So, you, so, so those of you who didn't see it can see it. But it was so powerful. He came back and testified that he feels so much happiness that he hadn't felt this happiness and joy since he was five years old. So it was even more than before when he gave it to the devil. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so it can happen by you opening up a door. Demons come in. It could also be by opening up a door with the wrong relationship where someone's not surrendered to God, where they are not an equally yoked relationship with you, and a demonic soul tie can form. You can be opening up a door by being in a wrong relationship. Romantic, friendship, anything. So that's, that's, that's you or a person opening up a door, how demons can come in. Number two, demons can come, the, the door can be opened by abuse. So young children, their parents have spiritual authority over them. Demons can enter, by the way, another way of sin, to rewind what I was just sharing about um, op- you opening the door, is by what you're watching and listening to. If you're watching horror movies, a spirit of fear, anxiety could enter. By listening to demonic music, a demon can enter in that way, too. And so think about kids. Actually, this happened to the boy I nannied. Um, He was 12 years old, and I was driving down Sunset Boulevard, and it was around Halloween time. And uh, he he, he got so afraid, he covered his eyes. He's like, ah, tell me when we passed that billboard. And I was like, what what happened? And it it was a demonic Halloween movie that's like, uh, it has... It was like a sequel, as you know, many different movies. And he said, the earlier movie, when I was young, I just walked in my parents watching it. And ever since I did that, I have nightmares of that movie. So a spirit, that a, de- a demon entered him when he saw that movie. Um, but he didn't want to see that movie, but the door was opened because the parents have spiritual authority. So you can't just play anything for your kids to be around, you, you're in charge of keeping doors shut to the devil for your children. Right? And so it's, it can be the same way when abuse happens. A parent could be allowing someone with doors open up to the devil into the home. And then the child could get abused. Now that was because the parent opened up the door. And that's how demons could come to the child. And so many people are, are being freed now from demons that entered them through abuse, sexual abuse as a child. And it wasn't the child opening up the door, but it was the, the parents. Um, and, so, and, and a lot of this stuff is just because my people perished because of lack of knowledge. People didn't know any better. They didn't know the real harm um, of keeping people close around to have doors open up to the devil, you know? So it's not to have shame, but it's time our eyes are opened up and it's time we get freedom and equipping. Hallelujah. And also, um, when a person is abused, like 
maybe if they're a teenager, let's say, or in their 20s or 30s or whenever they're abused in their life, um, they can be abused and then the devil can strategically send lies saying, this was your fault, you're dirty now, you're not pure, it was your fault that you were abused, um, you should have shame. And so a lot of people, you know, maybe they didn't open up a door for abuse to come, they weren't you know, the abuse just happened. It wasn't even a person they were in a relationship with. They couldn't control it. But they were supposed to then reject the lies of the devil that came, but many people don't know, don't have this equipping. So they believe these lies of the devil are truth and they accept them. So they've actually opened the door now by, by agreeing with those lies. So renouncing abuse is important. Renouncing, agreeing with the lies that came after the abuse is important as well. Amen? And then another way a door can open up can be through past generations. So this isn't you opening up a door, but this would be, or the person you're praying for, because we're talking about casting demons out of people. Um, but it could be the, a parent or a past generation that opened up a door that brought a generational curse upon the family that is now being passed down. Especially when one is involved with witchcraft. When you're you know, actively accessing demonic powers like that, it, it is generally a deeper kind of torment. Like, generally, that's when generational curses come, when there have been doors open up to witchcraft because it's deeper than just like sinning, but you are now like going full on the devil's side and seeking him for powers. And so that generally brings a deeper kind of torment, generational curse that can be passed down. So those are all the ways that doors can be opened. So it can be you opening up a door or the person opening up the door or a parent from the past or past generations. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. And then, um, as I shared crystals, um, things can, witchcraft items, sometimes you can uh, have a crystal that you're believing is going to heal you. So that crystal, that crystal itself has a demonic power attached to it. Um, witchcraft books or something, some, anything involved with witchcraft, demonic powers can be attached to it. Rings or other jewelry that maybe someone who manipulated you in a past relationship where you know there's a demonic soul tie in, a demonic spirit can be on that piece of jewelry, that object. It doesn't have to be jewelry, just objects. And so all of those things that I just mentioned and more it's important you renounce them and actually throw them away, like what they were doing in the book of Acts, burning. Throw them away. Renouncing them and throwing them away. Amen? So as you're praying for, as you're praying for people, um, I just want to mention this for you to know that when a person renounces, it does make the the grip of the devil, the demons, loosen. When there is a high-level anointing and that key is not needed, they don't, it, it, it's not like, like just the, the declaration, walking in authority, that's enough. Boom, the demons go. But when there isn't as high level of anointing, renouncing will probably be like for many of you probably you will you you will ask a person to renounce most times many times because if if the anointing isn't very high level it really helps the the legal access of the demons the grip to loosen amen so it can look different like if if someone came where the anointing is moving at a high level, dealing with principalities, as I taught last week. Um, they could just be here in the middle of the sermon. Maybe the demon will just go. No renouncing, nothing. Or 
maybe like here, for example, I just command the demon to go, no renouncing, they're free. But then someone, like one of you here, if you had prayed for that person before they came here, um, maybe that, maybe renouncing would make the demon to go, but just commanding the demon might not go. You see? So it depends on the level of anointing too. Hallelujah. So we're going over keys. We have faith is a key. We have an an, an executing authority, uh, an anointed vessel executing authority. We have a renouncing is a key that unlocks deliverance. And we have, lastly, there can be another key that may be needed. And this would be sowing into the kingdom of God, where God's power is. I, I taught about this a couple weeks ago. So I think it was not last week, not the week, but the week before. Um, it was a two-part message about sowing. And so if you didn't see those messages, make sure you watch that message because it's very important for you to understand this, this key. Because this is new wine. This is really new wine. But sometimes when, especially if there has been a lot of witchcraft in one's past, the, the demonic oppression is complex. There has been a lot of sowing into the demonic realm that's piled up in a person's life, contributing to so much entanglement of deep demonic oppression. And there is so much power in sowing. There is so much power in sowing. There's reaping that happens when we sow. And, and we see in the word of God that when people make sacrifices, the, the hand of God moves. Such as King David made a sacrifice, and then all of a sudden God showed up and he said, this, this plague must end now. I end this plague. Noah, he actually made a sacrifice, and the moment right after he made that sacrifice, God declared the promise that he would never wipe out humanity again, humanity again with a flood. King Solomon made a sacrifice, an offering, a sacrifice to God, and God immediately sh- appeared and said, what do you want? I will give it to you. There is power in sacrificing. It's, it's, the, it's the principle that, that there is power in sacrificing. That's why sowing into the kingdom of God is sometimes a key that unlocks the complete deliverance when it's more complex, simply because there is such power in the sacrifice. Amen? And when there has been so much sowing into the demonic kingdom, sowing into the kingdom of God makes that demonic reaping to go away to be lifted. Hallelujah. So now I've just gone over the main keys that unlock complete deliverance. Amen. So it's important you just have this understanding when it's time for you to cast out a demon, when it's time for you to pray someone and see them set free. It's important you have this understanding. It's a big understanding. Like, there's a lot, right? So make sure you take notes. Go back to this message. Take notes. It's not as simple as just, demon, go. Sometimes there can be other keys that are needed. Hallelujah. Um, So when it comes time to now pray for the person, lots of times you will you will. You can ask them to renounce. Ask them to renounce. You can explain to them what renouncing is. They might not know. You can explain to them. And ask them to renounce the specific oppression in their life. And also the open doors that they've had in their past. Because what we're doing is we are pinpointing where the legal access is. To make sure the demons can't hold on in any place. Hallelujah. So ask them to renounce. It's, it's also important. Sometimes the key is, is that they need to renounce something specifically. They need to take their renouncing seriously. It might not 
they might not know everything they need to renounce right away. They might need to go and take some time. That can be some of you here, your keys to be completely free. You can come receive some deliverance and you can be like, I need more, I need more. But God wants you to go home and take your deliverance seriously, take your surrender seriously and spend time with him and write down on a list with him all of the specific things that he's leading you to renounce. And then next Sunday, maybe, now that you are ready, you've taken it seriously, you've really surrendered, now it's time for God to free you all the way. Amen? So that's important that we understand that and understand God's timing. So we're not just like, get out, get out, get out. I, I don't feel fully free. Get out. And we keep going when that's, it's not being spiritual. Amen? So you can ask the person to, if they'd like to renounce, and then you can say, after they have renounced, you can say, I detach you from what you've renounced, or I detach you from these things. This isn't a script. It's very important. We are following the leading of the Holy Spirit and not treating it like a, a mechanical thing. Amen? So I detach you from these things, and I declare these spirits must go, or I declare these demons must go, or I command these demons must go, or they must leave. It doesn't matter how you say it, amen? But it's what you are saying that matters in Jesus' name. But that also doesn't have to be a robotic script because, because you, Jesus is your Lord and this anointing you have received has come from Jesus, you are coming in the name of Jesus. So for me to come, when I came up on the stage to say, and I say, welcome everyone, I didn't have to tell you, welcome everyone in the name of Jesus. I want to make sure you know that I'm coming in the name of Jesus. You know, I don't have to say that, right? So sometimes people can be religious and think we need to say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, always. It's good to say it a lot, but it's not like it, the, the real meaning of in Jesus' name is the spirit, in the spirit in the spirit of the name of Jesus, the spirit that you're coming in. Hallelujah. So you don't have to say, get out in Jesus' name. It's not like the demon won't go if you don't say, in Jesus' name. You know? Hallelujah. And I'm just saying this so you don't get in this, like, robotic formula script. Because that's always going, that's always entering into religion territory. We want to stay out of religion territory. Because that's the old wine. Amen? Hallelujah. So I declare these spirits must go in Jesus' name. And um, that's it. That's it. You don't have to keep repeating, get out, get out, get out, get out. Sometimes maybe Holy Spirit's revealing more to the person. You can ask them, is there anything else you wanted to renounce? Sometimes God may lead you prophetically. Sometimes you can, you can prophetically de be declaring these spirits must go. It's just with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's something I also want to share with it in the teaching that you can also speak. I break generational curses as you're praying for people. Sometimes people have had word curses spoken over of them, especially if they've been abused verbally. You can say, I break every word curse. Sometimes if people have renounced relationships, um, demonic soul ties, manipulation, you can say, I break every demonic soul tie. Sometimes there can be a curse of poverty. If they're renouncing that, or if God shows you prophetically, you can say, I break the curse of poverty. If witchcraft, if they've been involved with witchcraft or witchcraft has happened in the family, you can say, I break every curse of witchcraft. Amen? I just wanted to add that into the teaching, that as the Holy Spirit leads, you can also speak that as well. But once again, it's not something religious. We don't need to always speak it. And sometimes curses will be broken as you're commanding demons to go. Hallelujah. And then um, once you have prayed for them, they are free. You can, you can speak, I release this anointing upon you. May the, or you can speak, may the fire of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Or you can speak, be filled with the anointing, be filled with peace. Once again, this is not about a routine or a script. 
but you're just, you're being a vessel and God is doing everything. So you don't have to say these specific words for the anointing to come and fill them, for the, for the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit to come upon someone. The Holy Spirit may lead you sometimes to say, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in the, in the Acts church, we're seeing Peter, the apostles, they're preaching, and the Bible says that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fell upon the people as they were speaking, and they began speaking in other tongues. So that shows us that people can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without you saying, I baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And I say that because I think some people think that when they cast a demon out, they're like, we have to fill them now. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, speak in tongues. Like they think they need to hear them speaking in tongues or they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh no, demons are going to come back. No. Relax. Simply walk in your authority. Don't overcomplicate it. Ho- Holy Spirit is really the one who's doing all everything. Amen? Amen. They will be filled. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, um, sometimes... I want to share now um, for healing. Sometimes a demon can be behind the sickness. Sometimes you can just say, be healed. The sickness must leave you. How the Holy Spirit leads. But um, sometimes it could be a demon that's behind it. I remember one time I ministered in Houston and I, in mass deliverance, this woman testified later that I did mass deliverance. I said, spirit of infirmity must go. And she said that when I spoke that, she fell back with the power of God and um, she had, oh, what was it? What was the disease she had? Does anyone remember that testimony? It's something with an L. I don't know. She had, I think it's L. No, maybe not L. She had some sort of disease. And it made her, um, her, her ears not be able to hear. She was deaf. And when she felt, she fell back with the power of God. And all of a sudden, her, her hearing aids were too loud. Her ears opened up. So the spirit was needed to be cast out for the healing to come. So sometimes you need to command the spirit of infirmity to go. Sometimes it's just healing the sick. You're just sickness go, be healed. Hallelujah. So now after the prayer has taken place, there's a, a few things that can happen. A person can be set free, and they can truly feel it tangibly. I'm free! Hallelujah! That can happen. Sec- or a person can be set free, but there is no physical manifestation. They don't feel anything different, but they are actually free! Because it's in the spiritual realm that these miracles take place. Only sometimes do they manifest into the physical realm where you can feel it. And there's physical evidence immediately. Only sometimes. Amen? So it's important for that person that doesn't feel anything that they, re- that they receive by faith. They believe that they have been freed. And encourage them in that. That it don't, don't look for a feeling. Believe you are healed. Believe you are free. Amen? Another thing can happen. After you prayed for a person, a person can still be manifesting. Sometimes it's the demons are continuing to go. God is still working. Anointing can be like medicine, taking some time to work in a person. So this, sometimes this happens here where someone's still manifest, someone's manifest, well, someone's being free, but a person thinks they're manifesting. A person's actually being free. They're in the process of being free, of God delivering them. But other people can think that it's just demons manifesting and no freedom happening. And they can think, keep commanding the demon to go. That's why after service, it's not time to issue new commands over people. God has done the work. The words have been commanded, declared. Freedom is happening. Freedom has happened, and for some, it's still happening. For for many, it's not manifestation. They're actually being free. 
God's working still. So don't touch a, a wound. Let it heal. Don't poke it by issuing new commands when God's in the process of healing it. Amen? And then also, another thing that can happen once you, once you, once you prayed for a person is that the person can be delivered or healed on their way. As what happened with those with, le- with leprosy, Luke 17, 11, Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. As they went, on their way. So they, they, they received the anointing, the healing began, but it wasn't finished yet. It, wasn't, it didn't manifest physically until later, until they left Jesus. So that's how deliverance and healing can happen too. When you pray for a person, it, they may not see any kind of difference yet, but it's begun in the spiritual realm, and it will come into completion as the person walks in faith and rejects the lies of the devil, saying, you're not free, you're not healed, you need more. Amen? So those are all the different things that can happen, but I also want to mention to, that you also must be humble and realize that it could be a higher level demon. So maybe the demon didn't actually go, or maybe one demon left, but there's more still there. You dealt with the lower level demon, but there's higher level demons there still. So you really need to have humility and the fear of God when praying for someone. Don't just assume they're completely free. You know? And so what's so important once you prayed for someone is that you tell them the importance of surrendering to God. That's how you keep the door shut to the devil. And that's how you find true abundant life, eternal life, abundant life here and now. And number two... They must come to be planted at a church where God's power is. Because that's one of the doors that will be opened for demons to come back if you don't plant yourself. This is a principle from God that we must follow. This is where we receive receive equipping of how to keep doors shut even. And this is how we receive anointing of protection, covering of protection. It's needed. We need this spiritually. That we're malnourished without it. We're lost without it, without the equipping and the anointing that comes in the church, the, tr- the real church where God's power is. So you must tell them after you pray for them the importance of planning yourself. You can tell them they can watch online. Just share with them. Share. So those of you that are at Fivefold Church, this is your church, this is your home, you watching, tell them about Fivefold Church. Tell them how to watch online. Tell them the importance of of continually tuning in and receiving the anointing. Tell them, you may need more freedom. You'll get it here. The anointing is, gonna, is high level there. You're going to be free, completely free. Keep watching. And I have a playlist on my YouTube called How to Receive and Maintain Complete Deliverance. And, it, and there's a four-part message on how to maintain your deliverance. You must tell everyone you pray for to watch these videos because it's so important. It's so important. You have to be serious about keeping your freedom. You have to be serious about rejecting the devil, having victory over the devil, because the devil's not happy whenever anybody's set free, and he will try to come back. So you got to be equipped. That's why I did a four-part sermon. It's more than four hours long. You should tell them to watch it and watch it again and again and again and again and take it so seriously because the devil's serious about stealing, killing, and destroying, coming back. We got to be even more serious about having victory over the devil, about surrendering to Jesus and maintaining our freedom. Amen. So have the fear of God when you pray for somebody and speak to them from the heart the importance of these things, of being planted and maintaining your deliverance. Hallelujah. 
So you need to have in your heart when you pray for someone, I must tell them the importance of getting under the powerful anointing for complete freedom, protection, equipping, and impartation in their life. I must tell them this is important because you may need more. Number one, you need, you need protection, number two. And number three, you need to be equipped. You need to grow in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who's ready to walk in the anointing? Hallelujah. Follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. There will come a time. Don't force it, but there will come a time. And, or, and many times when God is asking you to walk in your authority and cast the demon out and, and, and release his anointing, release his freedom and healing to another person. This is all of our callings. Amen? All who believe these signs shall follow. They will cast out demons. They will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. Hallelujah. Revival is now. It's time to walk in God's anointing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to declare over all of you right now. Thank you, Jesus. I speak this anointing to cover you, and I declare wisdom to increase in you. May your spiritual eyes open up more so that you can hear the Holy Spirit as he leads you to minister to others, that you would walk in this wisdom, that you would truly be led by the Holy Spirit, and that you would really release this anointing effectively. In Jesus' name, may people be set free by God's power moving through you. May people be healed as you pray for them. May people have encounters with God's power as you minister to them in Jesus' name. And may doors open up now for these people in your lives, in your workplace, to be attracted to you, to come and receive Jesus through you in Jesus' name. May your light shine bright, so bright, and attract those who are lost, those who are sick, and those who are oppressed in Jesus' name. Amen.